you guys turn with me to Galatians chapter 6, and I'm not even happy about it. We are to our final week of our study together. I'm not ready to give Galatians up. And thank goodness we have another week. We have lots of homework to go. But we're going to get to see a preview, what we're calling our zone, coming into this chapter. And we will truly, in this present session, we'll cut straight to the middle of it. So keeping in mind... Putting all frustration aside, you will have done all the beginning part of the chapter. We're going to zero in right in the middle of it so that we can go straight for our zone. You have been so marvelous to memorize your zones, and I want you to tell them to me once again because I want our friends on the other side of the screen to be motivated constantly to have these in mind because should the Lord tarry in 20 years when someone says, if you ever studied Galatians, you could think, we, you could draw back into that well of your memory, pull back up those six words, and with those six words, you could once again tell what that letter is about just from six simple words words found within it. So zone one is what? Gospel. Zone two. Freedom. Zone three. Promise. Zone four. Children. Zone five. Spirit. And we are to our last one because the zones tell what is ahead. So even though we have one more session where we wrap it up, we won't have a zone that time. So this is our last one. Anybody know what it is? Cross. It is cross. We center right on the cross in our present Session. So I want you to turn with me to Galatians chapter 6. I'm going to read verses 12 through 15. 12 through 15. Those who want to make a good impression in the flesh are the ones who would compel you to be circumcised, but only to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even the circumcised don't keep the law themselves, and yet they want you to be circumcised in order to boast about your flesh. But as for me, I will never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The world has been crucified to me through the cross and I to the world. For both circumcision and uncircumcision mean nothing. What matters instead is a new creation. Does that sound like some theology to you? Will you look with me into the doctrine of the cross? Nothing like it. Everything about our faith hinges on the cross. That's where we will center our thoughts in this session. I love that God is not just a God of time. He's a God of timing. Because in my regular Bible reading this morning, now by that I mean what I try to do is that I get up early in the morning and when I have my prayer time, I try to do a scripture reading that is in this book of the Bible and then this book of the Bible, whether it is straight through like it was last year or in different books like I'm doing this year, whatever it may be. But I like to stay on a schedule where I'm not just picking what I'm reading that day, but it's sort have chosen for me because this is what I'm reading through right now. So I've been reading through the book of Acts. And so this very day of teaching this very session, it just so happened that I was reading the, the chapter uh, eight of the book of Acts that begins to tell us about Saul, the one we know as Paul. And I want to just read you a little bit of it because I want you to keep this guy in mind that this is the one God is using to pen the letter to the Galatians. At the very end of Acts 7, this is the stoning of Stephen, and it says that they laid their coats, their garments, in verse 58 of Acts 7, at the feet of a young man named Saul. It says then, of course, that Stephen is uh, stoned and is coming to the end of his life, cries out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, knelt down, cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And after saying this, he died. Now, Saul saw every single bit of this because the very next verse begins like this in chapter 8. Saul agreed with putting him to death. And on that day, a severe persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout the land of Judea and Samaria. Listen to this. Devout men buried Stephen and mourned deeply over him. Saul, however was ravaging the church. He would enter house after house and drag out men and women and put them in prison. 
if you have been raised a long time in the scriptures and these are common stories to you, it can be that sometimes they lose their edge. The, the blade gets dull and we forget this was him. I mean, that's serious stuff. When you stand there and watch someone lose their life, and can you think of many ways worse than a stoning? You are witness to this. You're going to watch everybody's coat. You're going to agree with it. I mean, you're cheering it on. And then while all these people are scattering, you're just ravaging the church, house to house, arresting people, just gleeing in the entire process. We know this even from Galatians. He tells this very testimony in the first chapter that we study together. He said, and I was a persecutor of the church. I persecuted the church of God violently, and he says this, and tried to destroy it. This is our writer. This is who God chose. This was the life he dramatically changed, and this is the one he gave the words in verse 14, but as for me... I will never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The world has been crucified to me through the cross and I to the world. Imagine the cross from his perspective. Imagine how you would think it would have taken a lot to save a man like me. Talk about appreciating the power of the cross. This was the same one who wrote in 1 Corinthians 2, 2, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, I've got this very, very meaty paragraph that is in your listening guide that is coming out of one of the commentaries that I just loved on this portion of Scripture. I have quoted Richard B. Hayes a number of times in our course together, but man, is this ever good. And I've got you a lot of blanks there, so get your pen ready. This is the kind of paragraph you might want to look at later and let it sink in. It's a beautiful way for us to begin drawing our series to a close because it's going to put it in a nutshell for us. So pen ready. All who preach the cross, as Paul does, can expect to encounter opposition and persecution from a world offended by a gospel that proclaims, are you ready to go? The end of all ethnic, social, and religious privilege and distinction. Talk about a powerful statement. And think with me, you don't have to stand at a pulpit to preach the cross. You can proclaim it at your coffee table or over lunch with a coworker, and you are still preaching the cross of Christ in a very legitimate way. And he says, the cross has put an end, fill it in, to all such systems. Oh, it, oh, it keeps getting good. It keeps getting good. By domesticating the gospel, however, and turning it into a minor refinement of the religion of the Sinaitic law, and he's talking about the law given at Mount Sinai to Moses, the Sinaitic law, the missionaries, and who he's calling the missionaries are the ones that came to dispute that the Gentiles could simply be saved by being justified by faith through the blood of Christ, and that they... They felt they needed to also be circumcised and also adhere to some of the laws of Judaism. So these are the people he's calling missionaries. But listen to what he says, that they were turning it into a minor refinement of the religion of the Sinaitic law. The missionaries would avoid the gospel's radical implications and thereby fit more comfortably into recognized religious categories. I want you to try to get a, a grasp on this because this is being thrown now into our laps because look around us, there is no longer an Apostle Paul. We have been entrusted with the gospel and it is indeed a trust. And he's saying to us, let me tell you something, the world is not going to like it. A lot of the religious world is not going to like it because there are a lot of implications involved here. They will want you to, to 
tone down the radical implications of it and fit it more comfortably into religious categories. Anybody getting that with me? I, I want to read this to you out of Galatians. You're right there. So look at Galatians 3. You've already studied this, but I want you to see it in terms of our present lesson. I want you to see the very end of it. I want to read Galatians 3, 27 through 29 to you. 3, 27, 29, I want to remind you, this is the basis for which he is getting it, proclaims the end of all ethnic, social, and religious privilege and distinction. It says in verse 27, for those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. There is no Jew or Greek, no slave or free, male and female, since you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed heirs according to the promise. There is none of that distinction, he says. Well, let me tell you something. Let, let this just roll over you because think how threatening that is. There's nothing as threatening as thinking that we are going to lose our place of privilege. See, when, when you put an end to what makes me feel distinctive and special, then you have put an end to my privilege over other people. And when you put an end to my privilege over other people, you have put an end to my fleshly power, and I want my fleshly power. Am I talking to anybody in the room tonight? We will fight to the death to hang on to our privilege. Wars are fought to hang on to our privilege because we will refuse in our, in our human craving to surrender that privilege over others. Listen, listen carefully to this. What makes us feel better is feeling better. You can take that to the bank. That in, in our humanity and in our just our the canyon uh, uh, cravings of our human souls, what makes us feel better is to feel better. I want to feel better by feeling better than you. If I feel better than you, then I feel better than I did because I'm at least better than somebody. Anybody understand what I'm saying? So when I'm no longer better, all of a sudden this gets threatening because then you're telling me I don't have power over them. I have nothing that makes me feel like I am worth more than them and something in my humanity makes me want to think that I am. Listen, nothing, and you know it's true, nothing will get the blood flowing like a rousing chorus of the old late 70s, we are the champions. <laughs> nothing like it. No time for losers, because we are the champions of the world. But there's just one little part of that that I beg to differ on, because especially when it comes to Christian champions, it makes us feel good to have the losers because we like the thought that we are kind to the losers. If we don't get to be kind to the lo losers, then we don't get to think of ourselves as noble and benevolent. So Christian champions, we need losers because we want to be nice to them <laughs> and we want to show our our, our virtue signaling out there in the world. So we're going to post how nice we are as a Christian champion to the losers. <laughs> Make them feel indebted to us, fawn over us, thank us so very much because how on earth are we supposed to feel like winners when there's no losers? Got to be losers. We need those losers. And here he comes and says, in the power of the cross, there is no one that wins any more than anyone else because what you have won is Christ. And your boasting is in the cross alone. See, when he says, all I'll boast in is the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does this do to our self-glorying? And oh man, we need our self-glorying. And all of a sudden, the legs are cut out from under it and we're called to be crucified to the world. Now what on earth does it mean 
through which I have been crucified to the world and the world to me. Because, of course, we're supposed to go into all the world. Uh, we're supposed to take the love of Christ. We're supposed to take the torch of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So there are all sorts of ways and all sorts of angles. It all depends on the context of what is meant when the New Testament, or Old, but particularly New Testament, where the gospel is concerned, where the word world is used. And so what does it mean here? And I love this definition. I, I looked at a couple of different places, but I really loved this one. This is uh, words of the New Testament scholar Herman in uh, Ritterboss. And he says this, the world here is characteristic, and now I'm quoting, of everything outside of Christ in which man seeks his glory and puts his trust. Well, he is saying that think of the world as this, everything outside of Christ in which we could seek to glory or put our trust. And so I want you to think about this. Listen, no translation on earth beats the King James Version for this uh, verse 14. None. I I'm just going to throw it out to you. If you're old school, you have heard it. And there's something about it being said just this way. But God forbid. Somebody say, God forbid. God forbid. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the words of Paul in Romans 3, 27, then what becomes of our boasting? And he just answers it in three words. It is excluded. It's gone. I want you to fill in a couple of blanks with me as we try to center on the centrality of the cross. Number one is this, the cross of Christ was not for minor refinement. I know you knew when we filled in that blank earlier in that paragraph that we were not going to miss going there because it was really the major point of the paragraph. This is no minor refinement. The cross of Christ was not for minor refinement. So it's such an important thing for us to remember, especially because we've already been told, listen, you can know going into it that preaching the cross is going to get opposition. And listen, nobody wants to be unliked. Nobody wants people to think they're an idiot. So, you know, everything in us wants to go, how can I soften it? And so my, my premise to you in this session is there is no way to soften it. You, there's no way to soften a hammer, wood, and a nail. The, the things that were chosen for the cross of Christ happen to be the kind of elements that it's really, really hard to soften. And I want you to see that with me because this is what we've been entrusted. That if we start somehow toning it down, we have lost the power of the cross of Christ. The cross is not a perspective. It was the sacrificial death of the person of Jesus Christ, the holy and one and only Son of God for the sins of the world. It's not just like an attitude, like a philosophy. It's not just a human ideology. It is the eternal plan of the immortal invisible. It is the word made flesh dwelling among us and nailed to a cross so that we might live. The cross was not just a symbol. It was salvation by the shed blood of the spotless lamb. It is substance, not shadow. Anybody tracking with me? Uh, th this was not a cold war. This was crucifixion. This was blood and guts. This was a killing. Now, I want you to hear this excerpt by Timothy George, one of the commentators on the book of Galatians. Listen to this because it's so powerful. I'm quoting him directly. Actually, the Latin word crux, C-R-U-X, the Latin word crux was regarded as an expression so crude, no polite Roman would utter it in public. He goes on to say, but what the world regards as too shameful to whisper in polite company, a detestable object used for the brutal execution of the dregs of society. Paul declared to be the proper basis for exaltation, 
In this and in this alone he would make his boast, in life and death for all time and eternity. What was just not even uttered by polite lips, he's saying, I will boast in nothing else but the cross of Christ alone. There is no way to dress up the cross that had been stripped down to bare wood and nails. The cross was the violent end of the lostness of believing man. There is no way to tone that down. It was thunderous. It was earthquaking. It was veil rending. It was Eden mending. This is hammer, wood, and nails. Tactile. We are not tweaked by the power of the cross. We are killed by it crucified with Christ to our old life and old person, made new creations in him. This is not a tweaking. This is a transformation. There's no way to tone the thing down. Hammer, wood, and nails don't tone down. I want to show you something. We cannot possibly have this lesson without looking at Colossians 2. I want you to turn with me there, and I want us to read a portion about the cross there. I want to read verses 13 through 15. And you, and when he says and you, it means every single one of us. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven us most of our trespasses. Is that what it says? All of our trespasses. Having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. I, I want you to just try to take this in for a minute, and I, I'm going to simplify it a little bit so that we can get it, but this is the main idea of it, that what he is nailing to the cross is every code of the law against you for every single time. You have transgressed. Every single time I have lied, every single time I have not loved my neighbor and I have coveted my neighbor's belongings, Every single time I have broken the law that you would find in those legal demands, every single one of those, every bit of the code that was written against you, every blame you could possibly have on your life, he that through the nails of the cross was literally nailed down to that wood, nailed to that cross with him. Before you were ever born, your sins were already nailed to the cross. I, I don't know what we do with that. It, what, what in the world do we do with that kind of grace? I mean, nailed down. I mean, we just keep pulling something off. We keep trying to remove the nails and, and take it back on. No, every single one of them, and through the power of the cross, every offense has been nailed to it. And he's triumphed over the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame. It's the most gorgeous double work that's done there in those passages because it says that he canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands and then he nailed it to the cross. So, I mean, he canceled it and then nailed it. Just, I mean, like, canceling it would be good. Nailing it would be good. No, no. He canceled it and also nailed it. It was like, what do you need here? Because it's been canceled and then it's been nailed. So when you go uncanceling and unnailing it, you better think twice. Because I gave my life for you to be free from the burden of your own pardon cross came with violence to bring peace. And he came and preached peace to all who were far off and peace to all who were near. For through him, we all have access in one spirit to the Father. That is no minor refinement. 
That is the killing of my old self and the new creation. I am, you are in Christ. Number two is this. The gospel's radical implications are unfazed by time. The gospel's radical implications are unfazed by time. In other words, I want you to understand something. As true and powerful as it was in that moment, it is in this moment. Should the Lord tarry, it will be next year and in a hundred years because the cross cannot lose its power. The blood doesn't dry in such a way that it somehow is diminished over time. The power of the cross is now unfazed, as radical as it ever was. Theologian F.F. F. Bruce writes these words. It might even be said that he took the document, ordinances and all, and nailed it to his cross as an act of triumphant defiance in the face of those, I love his wording here, those blackmailing powers that were holding it over men and women in order to command their allegiance. Those blackmailing powers. I don't know if all of you can relate to that. Maybe you don't have my kind of background. I hope that you don't. But one reason why the accuser has gotten so much mileage with me is that I gave him a lot of material. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, I just gave him a lot of things to bring back up. So it's really, really easy for him to start that condemnation with me because it's easy for me to believe it because I remember well where I have been. And those blackmailing powers, just think how the enemy torments and blackmails us. The accuser can no longer blackmail you. Is that anybody's good news? Listen, you've you got to keep the thunder in the power of the cross. you got to keep the nails sharp and the hammer hard. This is the power of the cross. Pounds, splinters, punctures. For those who put their faith in Christ, the cross of Christ reassesses everything. Our last and final point together, number three is this. A lot of words, but I think you'll like it. The theology of the cross does not fit comfortably into celebrated human categories. To the human who embraces its meaning, however, nothing compares to its comfort. Nothing. Oh, oh, there's nothing comfortable about the cross. There's nothing really comfortable about preaching the cross because it is a loud hammer, sharp nails, and splintering wood. But there is something very, very comforting about knowing that Christ has gone to the cross for us 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. All bondage to personal achievement is broken. The cross of Christ killed our chances to go to hell. Let me tell you something. If you have put your faith in Christ, it killed all your chances to go to hell. It's over for you. It's over for you. You lost your opportunity to go to hell. You no longer have any responsibility to figure out a way that you can pardon and that you can pay for your own sins. You, you may as well not spend time on how you can cover your own debt of sin. I, I know that you could agree with it. He saved my life. He saved me from hell. He saved me from Satan. He saved me from myself. Anybody? Anybody? I'm going to tell you something. The cross silenced the haunts of our past and the taunts of the fears of our future. Death has no power over us. We will open our eyes and we will see the face of the Savior who says, yep, this one I died for, completely pardoned, sin-free, come into your master's happiness. Let me tell you something. There are three words more than any others. If you want to know the, the true centrality of the cross and why everything pivots on it, why it is the central moment 
for which all of time was created in the midst of eternity, there are no three words that sum it up as totally central and totally significant in all of time like the three final words of Christ on the cross. It is finished. It's done. It's complete. And no one can undo it. Take that home with you.